Hi, I'm Julia Sanders, and I'm an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of Colorado, as well as the director of orthopedic trauma at Children's Hospital Colorado. I'm here to talk to you today about pediatric elbow fractures, specifically distal humerus fractures. These are the most common calls that we get in the orthopedic trauma department, and injuries can vary from very simple to very complex. The pediatric elbow can be really confusing on x-ray because elbow ossification occurs at different ages. So a lot of what you're looking at initially is cartilage. You can see that on this model where the white is bone and the clear part is cartilage. And you can see how the different fracture patterns actually go through the cartilage into the joint but wouldn't be able to be seen on x-ray. Recognizing the different fracture patterns that can occur is key to diagnosing and managing these injuries appropriately. The first type we'll talk about is the supracondylar humerus fracture. These can range from a non-displaced fracture, which we call a type 1, to completely displaced, which we call a type 3. Generally, any fracture that is displaced requires surgery. Some type 2 fractures that are minimally displaced can be treated with reduction and close monitoring. Completely displaced fractures can endanger the neurovascular structures at the anterior aspect of the elbow. So a careful exam and urgent or emergent transfer for surgery is important. Surgery involves a close reduction and pinning across this fracture line here. Pins stabilize the fracture until it's healed and can generally be removed in clinic in three to four weeks. The next injury we'll talk about is the lateral condyle fracture. These are the second most common distal humerus fracture we see in kids. As you can see on this model here, the red lines across the front and the back these are actually intra-articular fractures, and so can be pretty bad actors and always require a referral to orthopedics for evaluation and possible surgical management. If there is significant displacement, then an open reduction is required to ensure the articular surface is restored. These fractures also involve the distal humeral physis, or growth plate, so they tend to have a higher complication rate than the supracondylar humerus fractures, and we often monitor them even after healing for a period of time. Surgical treatment, again, involves fixation with either pins or with screws. The last fracture we'll talk about is the medial epicondyle fracture. The term epicondyle indicates that unlike the lateral condyle fracture, these are not intraarticular. These fractures occur when there is a force on the ulnar collateral ligament and forearm flexors that actually pulls off the medial epicondyle through the apophysis. They can be associated with elbow dislocations, and sometimes the medial epicondyle can even become incarcerated in the elbow joint when a dislocation is reduced. The other concern with these injuries is that the ulnar nerve is immediately adjacent to the medial epicondyle, so we always want to do a thorough neurovascular examination to ensure there's no ulnar nerve palsy. There is a lot of debate on which medial epicondyle fractures need surgery, but generally if the fracture is incarcerated in the joint, if it's really displaced, or if the patient is a high-demand athlete, like an overhead throwing athlete or a gymnast, surgery should be considered. Surgical treatment involves fixation with either suture anchors, pins, or screws. Hopefully this has clarified the pediatric elbow and its different fracture patterns a little bit for you. And on behalf of the whole orthopedics team here at Children's Hospital Colorado, we thank you for listening. If you'd like to refer a patient to us, we'd be happy to see them. Please use the contact information listed here.